Heavenly Father, I stand before you in the most humble manner that I know how. First, just to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for another day. For allowing me to rise with a reasonable portion of health, strength, and a sound mind. And assemble again again in your house of worship. Thank you, Father. Father, I ask that you would just forgive me, Father, for my sins. Father, please look within me, and anything you find is not pleasing in my sight. I ask you to just remove it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, it's preaching time. Pray you would just let me decrease while you increase. Pray, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit would have his way. Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would just let your words be my words and your thoughts be my thoughts. Use me, Lord, for your glory. O oh Lord, I ask that you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight. In my sight. Oh Lord, you're my strength and my redeemer. For us, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and ask it all. Amen. John's Gospel, the sixth chapter, starting at verse 5. First, I want to give all praise to God, because it's in Him that we live, move, and have our being. Honor and respect to Pastor Trotter, thanking him for this opportunity to stand before you today. To my brothers in the ministry, to everyone else in the sound of my voice, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Appreciate if I get a little more volume, please. John's Gospel, the sixth chapter, starting at verse 5, I'm read verses 5 through 14. It says, When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today's message comes in the form of a question. What are you bringing to the table? So initially, this question was asked to determine the dish that someone was going to bring to a meal. However, the use of this question has evolved over time. What are you bringing to the table? I mean, growing up, it was used by my parents as a reminder that the food that I was eating was not free. And that I wasn't grown until I had a job that could support my growing appetite. What are you bringing to the table? Socially, the question is asked by males and females to determine their significant other's contribution to the relationship. What are you bringing to the table? Even professionally, the question is asked on jobs to determine if a person has a solution to help solve the problem that is at hand. So the real meaning of this question is, what can you or I provide that can be a benefit? What can we can do to contribute to something? What are you bringing to the table? But you know, this question has spiritual implications as well. One day, 
when we are showering God with our requests. I just wonder what would happen if he responded to us by insert your name here. What are you bringing to the table? I mean, insert your name here. What is your contribution to the problem at hand? The problems of family violence, hunger, financial literacy, teen pregnancy, increasing high school dropouts, and decreasing college enrollment. What about racism? What about discrimination? What about hate? I mean, the world has some real problems. And the church needs to provide some real solutions. So what are you bringing to the table? Over the past year, I've learned more than I care to know about the global supply chain. I wonder why it took a clock that should have took two weeks to get here five months. I learned that this entire economy is based on inputs and outputs, specifically how raw materials inputs are transformed into products, outputs, that people consume. And as we've seen with the computer chip chip shortages, issues with input causing deficiencies where the supply chain can no longer meet demand. So for the purpose of this message, I would like to introduce the concept of spiritual supply and demand. What is that? That's when God takes our inputs transform them into an output to accomplish his purpose. See, God takes what we have, our input, and turns it into what he needs, an output, to accomplish his purpose. Let me give you an example. Look at the wedding at Cana in John 2. See, there was a demand. There was a need for wine. Jesus took the water, the input, transformed it into an output, the wine, to accomplish his purpose. Need another example? Look at John 9. Talks about Jesus' encounter with a man that had been blind from birth. You see, there was a demand. There was a need. The man was blind from birth. Jesus took the dirt and his spit from the ground, the input, transformed it into anointing clay the output to accomplish his purpose the man received his sight and as I look at today's text we see that Jesus had left Jerusalem crossed the Sea of Galilee and we had withdrawn to a remote place with his disciples but they were not alone the scripture tells us that a great multitude followed him there because of the miracles that they had seen him perform so as the evening drew near Jesus asked Philip a rhetorical question. Where were they going to buy bread for the people to eat? Now the correct answer for Philip would have been to say, Lord, you know. Because Jesus did know how he was going to work it out. But Philip responds in verse 7 by saying that they don't have enough money. Sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? They don't have enough money. But in verse 9, Andrew finds a boy that had five barley loaves and two small fishes. But even he asked the question, what are they among so many? Both Philip and Andrew thought that they had too much demand and not enough supply. But I'd like to look at this passage from the perspective of this lad. Now, John's gospel is the only record record of this boy. And I just believe that there are some lessons that we can learn from this lad. First point I would like to make is about this lad's presence. You see, this boy didn't stay at home. He wasn't hanging out with his friends. He was where God needed him to be. You see, he was in a right place, in the right place. You see, there was a time when mom and dad went to church. The whole house went with them. But now we have this new normal. Children have options. Baby, do you feel like going to church? This new normal where today parents go to church and the kids stay at home. What about us adults? Sometimes we find ourselves as adults out of positions. I mean, we have a presence, but it's in the wrong place. See, God needs our contribution here. God needs our contribution 
here. I'll go ahead and say it. Here at Friendship. But we're too caught up trying to make things happen over there. As Rick Warren says in The Purpose Driven Life, we can't create our own waves in life. We must learn to surf the waves that God sends our way so we can learn from this lad's presence. But we also need to learn from this lad's perspective, his perspective, the way he looked at things. You see, barley loaves were cheap bread that resembled what we call tea cakes. Now, the small fish were probably similar in size to sardines. Now, this was a meal of the poor. And I just believe that Andrew didn't just take this boy's lunch. I believe that he told the boy that the master has a need for it. You see, this boy didn't have much, but he gave all that he had. And to us, we need to stop thinking that we don't have anything that God can use. Just like this lad, God will use what you have to accomplish his purpose. But you must be willing to surrender it to him. Surrender to him. And here lies, there lies the problem. You see, on a spiritual level, the world is having supply chain issues. We find that Paradio's principle, the 80-20 rule applies in our churches today, where 20% of the members are producing 80% of the work. And one can only wonder how much more impactful the church would be if 80% of the people were contributing, if 80% of the people were engaged in ministry. How more impactful would churches be if 80% of the people provided something of benefit? How more impactful would friendship be if 80% of the people brought something to the table? But instead, we have Christians that won't supply the input for God to transform into an output. They won't give up their time. They won't give up their talents. And they won't give up their tangibles or their resources. So I have a question today. Are you willing to do what is necessary for God to accomplish his purpose? What if he requires you to use that fancy car as a delivery to truck to pick up boxes or drop off boxes of food to those in need? What if he requires the room in your luxurious house to give it to a single mother that lost her job and is facing shelter or the streets? What if it requires you to give up some stuff that you wanted to keep for yourself? So what are you bringing? What am I bringing to the table? So we can learn from this lad's presence. We can learn from this lad's perspective. And finally, we can learn from this lad's provision. You see, this little boy provided something that Jesus used. I need to tell somebody today that we need to stop listening to Satan. We all have something that God can use. But we need to stop hoarding it. Hoarding, y'all seen the show? Hoarding. No matter how much or how no, no matter how much or how little you have, God can do more with it than we can. But we have to be willing to surrender it to him. So as I hurry on, verse 11 describes what Jesus did to this boy's meager meal. Scripture said that he took the loaves and the fish, parted them, and handed them to his disciples, and the disciples to the men that were sitting. Scripture says that they ate as much as they would, which means they ate until they were full. Aren't you glad that Jesus truly satisfies? Let me allow me to bring this a little closer to home. You know, it's hard for a hungry person to stay focused. I mean, you and I can have the best conversation. But when I get hungry, my focus is going to shift from what you said or saying to what I'm going to eat. So Jesus had filled the people spiritually and physically. So when they walked home talking about, oh, how he preached, the conversation would get cut short, worried about what they're going to eat. 
what they're going to eat. Jesus filled them spiritually as well as physically. So after they had eaten until they were full, Jesus tells his disciples in verse 12 to gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. See, what started with this boy's meager provisions now ended with his disciples gathering leftovers. Now, they didn't have freezer bags. So what did they do with the leftovers? What did they do with the leftovers? Look at us today. We're such a wasteful society. We don't like something, we just throw it away. We want something new, we just throw the old away. But we need to remember that God may choose to bless someone else through your leftovers. I mean, what we consider as fragments just might be someone else's overflow. So this story ends in verse 13. With the disciples collecting 12 baskets full of fragments. You see, in verse 7, Philip just wanted to give them something a little. A little something to put on their stomach. Y'all know how we do it, just to get them home when they can eat at home. But this lad brought something to the table. Jesus used what he had to accomplish his purpose. He used what this boy brought to the table to accomplish his purpose. I need to tell somebody today to stop thinking that you can't make a difference. Stop thinking that your contribution won't measure up to someone else's. You already have everything that you need. You just need to surrender it to the Lord. So what was Jesus' purpose in this passage? Why did he choose to perform the miracle for the multitude? Well, the answer is found in verse 14. You see, when the men that had eaten were talking among themselves, chopping it up as we call it, they realized that Jesus was the prophet that Moses had spoken about in Deuteronomy 18 and 15. So what is God's purpose for mankind? It's for people to know him through his son, Jesus Christ and to change our lives so we can lead others to him. Just like this lad, we need to let God transform our input, what we give it, into an output that can be used to accomplish his will. Jesus tells us in Matthew 9 37 that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That tells me today that we have a spiritual supply and demand problem. See, the demand is high. Just look at the news every day. The world needs what the church can offer. But we have too many Christians that won't feed the supply chain. They won't feed the supply side. They prefer to sit things out and watch somebody else do the work. But in order to see real transformation in people, we need to put in for God to put out. The church needs our time. The church needs our talents. The church needs our resources to bring light to a dark world. So we must all ask ourselves the question, what are we doing bringing to the table? What are we giving God, let him use so he can transform it into what can help others? What are we bringing to the table? This lad left a legacy for us all to see. This lad's presence this last perspective, and this last provision. That's a legacy for us. So what are we bringing to the table? God bless you.